um, be doing, guys, is I'm going to post the uh, class recordings. And okay, that's starting right now. You can hit continue there. Um, I will post them on YouTube, and then I'll give you the link to the YouTube posting. The reason I do that is Canvas is very limited in terms of the size of the files that you can accumulate on Canvas. And at some point, they start cutting me off. Um, so what I will do is I will post them on YouTube and then give you the link in Canvas. The only thing that I caution, because sometimes students go out to YouTube and they see something that they're saying, geez, you know, Professor Lord shouldn't have had that on his YouTube page. And it's not me, it's not on my YouTube page. It's YouTube selecting things that they think you might be interested in. Uh, it's not something that I put there. The only thing you see on my YouTube page is fat guys talking about accounting. Okay, that's all you see on my YouTube page that I put there. Um, everything else is, um, you know, stuff on the sides that YouTube selects. But that's how we'll do it, and I'll post those up. Okay. Um, this is the textbook, okay? Um, how do I say this? The university expects that I will have required reading for the course. And so I have to select a textbook. I have to assign a textbook and I provide homework questions over there. I am not a person that comes in to people like yourself that have accomplished what you've accomplished and comes back behind you to see if you did some homework assignment in the textbook. So if you never acquired the textbook and never did the homework from the textbook, I wouldn't know it because I'm not gonna be checking on your homework. But I can't tell you no textbook because if I do, then the university gets upset because I don't have the required reading and I don't want to make the university upset. So, um, so here's this textbook, okay? What I would recommend you do anyway at first is to go ahead and go out to this hyperlink in McGraw-Hill, and some of you may already have a McGraw-Hill account, okay? And provide them your email right here and don't give them any money up front take advantage of the two, I think it's a two week trial period, check it out, see if you like it. And if you like it, then I think they're gonna ask you like a hundred and, I think it's a hundred and almost 137. Huh? 137, um, I tried that. I could not purchase a thing. I was dying to, to this part, so yeah. <laughs> same, I, I had the same issue, it's not published yeah. yet. Yeah, the book is not available. We can't buy the book yet. Yeah. It's not I, how do you know it's 137 then? If, yeah, because the price, uh, we, we did you go it. in there. Yeah. <laughs> I was on the phone with McGraw Hill today. And uh -huh. so the ebook and the Connect um, website functionality has not been published yet. It's not being published until uh, May, right? April, May, right? A April 4th for the, the, uh, the combination. And, uh, but I think we can, we can buy a loose leaf because that was published in February, um, but there is no, but there is no connect section that comes yeah. with Yeah, it. so yeah. Oh, I was hoping uh, you can um, help us. I don't it. understand what's going on. If you follow that link, it should take you here and you should be able to register for the class. The link takes me to a to a page where I have to enter a connect twenty digit code. Yeah, we don't is, have the which, code. Which is not available yet through McGraw Hill until the fourth of April. That's my understanding per conversation with the customer service rep today. I think you're right. So yes, that doesn't make any sense. I don't that that somehow that's not holding up to my understanding of the process. Because if you look, sometimes the mistake I make is I set the registration date at a time that's um, 
already expired and you know and then they say well you can't register anymore because the registration dates have expired but this is 310 21 to 3 12 31 22 so this april whatever date isn't making any sense to me you should by following that link be able to go in and see this so i'm sorry would you like us to maybe one of us share the screen so you can see from our perspective? Um, no, what I think I'm going to do is check with them and uh, try to understand what it is that they're saying um, because that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't add up. So let me understand what they're saying because sometimes they Guys, we're in a world where people make things up uh, as they go along. And, uh, you know, you might have talked to somebody that just wanted to get off the phone with you um, and didn't really fully answer um, your question properly. So, um, so let's just go ahead and put that on hold and I'll get an answer after you. We'll know definitely by Thursday, okay? But once you can get past this, there is a free trial period. And that's what you should be uh, using at first because I'm not going to be checking the homework in Connect. I've given you assignments and whatnot in there in Connect. You can work those. If you like them, then maybe you go ahead and you uh, cough up, what did somebody say? The one, whatever it was, 139, whatever. If they ask you for um, the ebook and for connect, if you don't like it that much, um, then I'm not going to know if you don't purchase it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so you decide on that. Okay. Can I ask something on that? Yeah, sure. How helpful do you think the homeworks would be for the tests? Not that helpful. Okay. <laughs> extra batting practice. Um, I'm, uh, I'll show you the way we're going to structure things here in a minute, but I'm not a guy who plays hide and seek with what I want you to know. I'm much more, this is what you need to know to get a hundred percent on the exam. And I train you on that. I drill you on that. I give you practice on that. And that comes in the form of what I call practice midterms. The problem with textbooks is they will sit there and they'll write any manner of homework question for you. And then they forget to link that up to a testable, a test function. So I don't like to make folks jump through hoops that don't, that aren't representative of the hoops I'm going to make them jump through for credit, for a grade. How's that is for not answering your question? That kind of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Um, so I'll get the answer on the textbook. Grades are primarily from your exams, but we will have a guest speaker. The guest speaker is, um, we can think about maybe having somebody from the auditing side or from the preparation side or both maybe. And if we have an extra speaker, I could you know, do it 50 points each write up, or I could say, okay, 100 points for one. And if you decide to do the second one, that is a um, bonus for you, extra credit. Um, the only thing about guest speakers, guys, is I am pretty rough on expecting you to be there for the guest speaker. So I don't like to have a guest speaker and then, you know, nobody shows up to the class. Um, in fact, I, I'm kind of giving my under lower division undergraduate speech here to you guys. And so it's really not necessary for me to say all this, but it just bothers me if I have people that don't show up to class and stuff. So try to be here in class. You really should be here in class. And definitely, definitely we have a guest speaker um, I, I want full attendance and participation, obviously, when we have uh, someone from the outside, right, coming in to talk to our MSA folks. 
You can see the grades. Um, I am fine giving all A's in this class. Okay, um, for my graduate students, I often do that. For my undergraduate students, particularly the lower division classes, I never have to do that because there's always X amount of people that are fine living down here for some weird reason. But I don't have a curve or anything like that. Okay, the examinations are 30 multiple choice questions. Okay, 30 multiple choice questions, four choices each, very similar to CPA type questions that you'd see in governmental not for profit accounting. Okay, uh, professor, the grades, yeah. Oh, uh, you kind of cut out a little bit um, when you were speaking. Can you go back to what you're saying before the undergrad students that were fine being in the DC range? You said something about the master specifically. For my master's students, it wouldn't be unusual for me to give all like A's and A minuses and stuff. Okay. Yeah. That's what I said. For my undergraduate students, I don't know why some of them just want to live down here. I don't know why. I never. These get degrees. <laughs> huh? These get degrees. Or is it C's get degrees? One of those. <laughs> yeah. I get. Yeah. Okay. And A's get nice jobs. <laughs> so anyway, okay. Um, exams, you know, I'm going to show you the exam dates. Just take the exams on the dates that they're scheduled. If something horrible happens, you get abducted by aliens or something, then I'm going to need you to bring me a note from the aliens saying we abducted this person on this date and this is why they couldn't take the test. So I start to get into requirement of documentation. And guys, I was an auditor for 26 years. So I know the documentation walk, dance. If I ask you for this and you give me a reason why you can't give me that, then I'm gonna ask you for this. If you tell me, hey, I asked you for that, and you tell me you can't give me this, I'm gonna ask you for this. So um, I will expect you to document the highly unusual prospect where you miss an exam. Okay, my expectations, you'll take it on the day that it's scheduled. It's three exams, 30 multiple choice questions each. Um, you'll be able to take them right here in Canvas. Um, three, um, I give you plenty of time to work those 30 multiple choice questions. We'll look at the timing here in a second. There's no reason why you should be able to walk in here and crush these exams. So just take them when they're scheduled. Okay. University policies, schedule. I heard you guys talking about spring break or something, or, well, you said winter break, right? So we have spring break coming up in the 30th, and then we'll have that first midterm, um, the entire class period to thir work 30 multiple choice questions. I think you can do that. That second midterm, um, I may cut you off a little bit so we can start on chapter 14, but I, I won't be squeezing you so much on time that you will feel that you can't finish it. And then we get to these last few chapters and then the final. Each exam has 30 multiple choice questions. They are not cumulative. Um, what do you call it? Comprehensive. So it's not like if the for the final, it's going to be all the chapters we covered in the class. It'll just be the last, in this case, uh, what, four chapters or so? What, 11, 14, 15, 16, 17? Yeah, uh, 16, so the four chapters. Question. I'll be providing a rubric for you on the class paper. It'll be three pages and it'll be writing up and asking some specific things about the guest speaker. So stay tuned. I think I did I call out a date for the guest speaker. I think I did. Right. Yeah, it's in the syllabus. Yeah, right here. April 8th. After the first midterm. Okay. 
So I'll be giving you some guidance on that. Is there also a guest speaker on the 22nd? Oh yeah, I guess there is. So I guess I already decided we're gonna have two. Sorry. We're gonna have two and each one will be what, 50 points? Sorry about that guys, I forgot. So each one will be 50, guest speaker write ups, John. Each one will be 50 points and we'll have two. So I guess I already decided that. We'll have one that's talking from the standpoint of industry, um, the actual uh, side talking about um, if you work for say a government agency, I'll probably try to get somebody from the city and county, uh, city of San Jose or Santa Clara County to come speak to us about what they do. And then um, for this one, uh, it'll be someone who's involved in audits. Um, and I put it here after we talked about not-for-profit organizations, because what happens if you're not-for-profit and you receive money from the federal government, you have to, um, you have to um, undergo something called a single audit. So I'll have somebody and talk about that part because it kind of relates to both government and to uh, not-for-profit at that point. So yeah, two guest speakers, 50 points each paper, two three-page papers, six, point, uh, six pages total. Um, you know, one, one three and another one three. Um, I'm not terribly critical on how I uh, grade the paper. So what you really wanna do is come with a mind of interest, an idea of interest, so that you can sit there and I'll give you some questions I want you to answer, be thoughtful in your responses. And, uh, you know, I, don't, I generally give all the points on this pretty easily. Now it's single space or double space. <laughs> huh? Single space or double space for this three page. Um, let's see. I forget. This is not the questions I'm going to have you answer. Three page paper, three pages, double space, no far larger than 12 points, standard margins, da da da. I can sit there with a ruler and measure your point. But if you don't put that, there's always somebody that says page one, it, page two, was, page three, good, you know. Um, so we have to somehow limit, So, but it's double spaced. And these aren't the questions necessarily at this point, because this was a different speaker. Um, you know, I'll have some different things like this, but it'll look something like that. Okay, question? Question about the syllabus? Okay, good, and I'll, um, looks like I'll get a chance to uh, yell at, I mean, talk to McGraw-Hill tomorrow and understand uh, what the issue is, why that's not going through and see what we gotta do there. I have a question, Professor. Yeah. Um, so how would you prepare for the exams? Um, well, that's, let, let's do this. Let's answer that by just sort of looking at how the course is scheduled and can, uh, structured here in Canvas. Great, so thank you. Um, you can see the office hour, right? So you just log and click on there, obviously it's Zoom. Um, when you go in, if I have another student in there, which I almost never do, um, then it'll put you in the waiting room. So just kind of chill and I'll admit you after the other person leaves. I'll be putting some of that CPA guidance. You can't see this yet, but I'll be putting some of that up there. Okay. Supplemental readings. These supplemental readings are the Becker textbooks. Uh, textbook chapters for government and not-for-profit. 
Okay, so I just went ahead and stuck those in there since Becker gives me access to them. You just went through the syllabus. What I'll be doing is I'll be posting up practice midterm and final. And when you see these, I don't put them now because then I lose folks attention because everyone starts saying, okay, just focus on the practice midterm and don't bother to do anything else. So this particular practice midterm is not a good example because everything's from chapter four. And what I want, oh no, here we go. See how this practice midterm has questions from chapter four mainly, but also chapter two, and there would be some from chapter one, et cetera. So that practice midterm is comprehensive and that it has questions that are similar to what you're gonna see on your exam. And it's giving you things from chapter one, two, three, four, since our first midterm covers those four chapters. When you get to uh, practice midterm, practice for midterm two, okay, down here, for example, okay, then the questions that are listed here, anytime you wanna open up for me will be fine. The questions that are listed here would be questions from chapter five, six, seven, eight, so on. Okay, so we will look at these just the class before the midterm. Okay, um, now week to week, what happens is each chapter also has a practice midterm. So this chapter one practice midterm is just for um, uh, chapter one type questions, okay? But every one of the practice midterms, whether it's a comprehensive one or one that just relates to that chapter, these, not these exact questions, but these are representative of the questions that I'm going to be asking you. So you ask how to study for the midterms, how to study for the class. Um, my advice is that you come to class, you listen to the lecture, I'll record the lectures. Um, you follow along with the slides. Each class has a set of slides that are posted up. So what I would do is have the slides either print them and have them so you can write on the hard copy or have them on your tablet so you can mark up because I mark up the slides and so you'll probably want to mark it up and make notes of things I say and whatnot as you go along. So you've got the slides, you understand the slides, you study the slides. Uh, if you get stuck on something, you're like, what the hell was this? Go back to that point in the lecture and hear what I said again about it. If you're still confused, shoot me an email, call me, come to the office hour or whatever and then practice with these practice midterms, right? You do that for chapter one, chapter two. Chapter three, I didn't publish what's here because we can really cover everything that we need to from chapter three in the 4A, 4B material. Chapter four, I've broken into two sides, revenue recognition versus accounting for expenses and expenditures. And then we would have that first midterm. So if you get good with these class examples, the slides, and then most importantly, you then apply that knowledge, you practice applying that knowledge to these practice midterms. And then as you get closer to the exam, I open up this part and you actually then can sit there and take these more comprehensive midterms. And what I recommend you do, you see I highlighted the answers unhighlight the answers and take it as though you're actually taking the test. Test day comes, open book, if you got the book, open book, open note, okay, any open slides, anything I give you in this class. You cannot go to Chegg or one of these Chug or whatever the hell these uh, Hero or whatever the name these sites are that my former students went and posted my ex old exams on. You can't use that kind of material. And the um, sad mistake that people make is they see on Course Hero, okay, John Lord, governmental accounting, San Jose State, here's his exam, you know. 
And then someone looks at that and thinks, oh, okay, this is exactly what he's going to ask us. And here I come in with some new stuff. Now you're underprepared. So if you do it the way I'm asking you to, I take the weightlifting approach. When we're doing the lecture, you're kind of like, what's he talking about? How did that work again? Can you say that again? Huh? What? Then you kind of go through and you look at the slides on your own. Okay, got it. Then you practice with those practice midterms, chapter by chapter. And then you are ready to take those more comprehensive practice midterms that have the questions from all the chapters that will be covered. I don't see why you wouldn't be able to come in here with three hours, open book, open note. You should crush this thing. You shouldn't miss a single question. Is that, does that kind of answer? Yeah, thank you. That was very helpful. Yeah. I'm not here to mess up your GPA. I'm here to give you some exposure to governmental not-for-profit accounting, right? Some folks said they thought it'd be a little interesting. I think it is. Understanding how governments, you know, balance their budgets, that kind of thing. Um, I'm here to help you to understand how you would maybe tested this on the CPA exam, since a lot of folks are thinking CPA. I'm here to get you to kind of understand how professionals see this area that are in the industry. That's where we have the guest speaker. I'm here to get you an A out of that experience if I possibly can. I'm not here to trick you. I'm not here to test your ability to deal with a weirdly written question. That's not our objective here. Question. Okay, good. So the one thing that I need to do, right, is find out what's going on with McGraw-Hill. Okay, so I'll get on that and I'll get you some, uh, some answer on that. But I find, you know, I'm not going to look to see if you get the book or not. I find that some students find just reading through this material, um, which is more summarized, very helpful uh, than a whole textbook. But I, you know, I can't say, I didn't say that. Cut, okay, I didn't say that. You, you know, they want you to get the book if, you know, but the university does, but you don't have to. And as far, I'm not looking. I don't know if you get it or not. They want you to get it though. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. So what we're gonna do, I think now is a good time to take a quick break. Okay, why don't we go ahead and uh, let's just make it an even 3.30. Now that's a little too long. We'll make it 3.25, how about that? We'll do 3.25. We will come back and we will jump into chapter one if that sounds like a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you. guys. See you in a little while. Thank you, Professor. Mm Okay. All right, good. And then, of course, the lecture I forget to record is always my genius lecture, right? Okay, so uh, <laughs> now it won't be that good because I remember to record it, whatever that means. Okay. All right, good. So let's just go ahead and take a look at chapter one, which is basically going to be our introduction here. Okay. And um, when we talk about governments, we're talking about in this class, state and local government. Okay, we're not talking about federal government accounting. Federal government accounting is very specialized, very uh, specific to federal agencies. Uh, we're going to see that it's standards that are promulgated by the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board. We're not going to get into that in this class for a couple of reasons. One, even if you were to go to work for the federal government here in the Bay Area, which is possible, 
you probably wouldn't be involved in the financial accounting and reporting aspects of that federal agency. You'd probably be doing some sort of program type audit, uh, not really getting into the financial reporting aspects. Secondly, um, the CPA exam does not, does not test federal government accounting. Okay, so we were teaching this class, say, in Washington or in Virginia somewhere, I'd say, yeah, okay, I kind of see that we need to cover that. Here, we don't need to worry about talking about uh, federal government accounting. So in here, we're talking about the accounting for state and local governments, state of California, city of San Jose, county of Santa Clara, city of San Francisco, county of San Francisco, all of these entities use the accounting that we're talking about in this class. We're going to see that the standards are promulgated by the Government Accounting Standards Board and GASB writes the standards that are then followed by all of these entities. It is particularly relevant to this class because there are tens of thousands of state and local governments that you may either work for directly, you may go work for the city, the county, we had some folks that said they worked in that capacity, or you may be working for one of the CPA firms that audits these entities. Um, was Matthew, were you Grant Thornton? Grant Thornton for a while there was uh, doing a fair amount of work in this area, I believe. Do you know if they still are? Uh, doing a lot of state and local government audit work? Uh, I'm not sure. I was just okay. on a local company's audit. Y yeah. I could okay. look into it though. <laughs> yeah, it might be something to ask around um, about because they were doing those. Um, I forgot my former student's name. His first name was Jake. His first name still is Jake. He's my former student. Um, he was working with um, Grant Thornton, I thought I heard from him or somebody that they were doing state and local audits. Um, but various firms will do some state and local work. There's a firm, and I don't know what the um, three letters stand for. It's three person's names, but don't ask me the names, but it's MGO is the name of the firm. And they do audits for, they do the audit for the city of San Jose, county of San Jose, city and county of San Francisco, city and county of Los Angeles. So I'm going to reach out to my contact there and see if that might be the firm that we can get to come to talk to us about uh, auditing state and local governments. So there's an obvious relevance there. And then again, not that this is a CPA review class by any stretch, but the CPA exam does test the accounting for state and local government. So we'll be kind of filling in uh, some folks objectives for helping, you know, to get some sense for the CPA exam, get some, some chops in there for the CPA. Okay. So we have state and local governments. We have um, cities, counties, townships, and guys, these are often referred to. Okay as general purpose governments, okay? Now they call them general purpose governments because they do a lot of different things. Um, they, if you're a city, you do what? You provide some public safety. What's examples of things that uh, cities do that would fit under the public safety function, do you think? Police That's departments. It. Yeah, fire and police. In fact, sometimes they call it public safety. Fire and police, they call it public safety. They don't call it fire. They don't call it police. They just call it public safety. I have a friend who used to work for the um, city of San Jose as a police officer, and he's retired now. But um, when he worked for the city of San Jose as a police officer, he used to tell me, oh, yeah, that city is public safety. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? That means that when you apply for a job there, you have to be able to do functions that a fire person would do, functions that a police officer would do. And so um, he was happy to be at San Jose, which I don't think they break out jobs as public safety. You're either fire or you're police. But yeah, fire and police. Uh, but there's also things beyond public safety, for example, recreation. 
So the city would be over different aspects of the park. The county would be over different aspects of a park. You may have a water utility that runs through, no pun intended, the city uh, government operations. So there may be water and sewer. So there could be a variety of things that a general purpose government does. Okay, now that is contrasted with what we talk about with special purpose government. Special purpose government has a singular special type purpose. For example, if you are a school system, what's your special purpose, do you think? If you had to guess. To educate students. <laughs> Education, know. right? I believe the children are the future and all that kind of stuff is what you're all about, right? And of course, uh, you know, the uh, school systems have uh, had their world turned upside down, right? Uh, public colleges and universities are special purpose governments. Let me ask you a question. Can you think of a public state-run institution that's a university? Is it San Jose State University? There you go, San Jose State, right? Is a what? Is a public state-run university. San Jose State would practice the accounting that we're learning here in our state and local government accounting, right? Okay, so you have general purpose government, you have what? You have special purpose governments and basically general purpose do a lot of different things. Those examples are cities, counties, states obviously have general purpose, right? And then when you're dealing with special purpose governments, they have singular purposes like a school district. Question on that. Okay. All right, good. Now, when we talk about not-for-profit organizations, okay, um, one of the key things about not-for-profit organizations is they are exempt from federal, state, local taxation. Okay, classic example of a not-for-profit that is exempt from tax is going to be uh, churches. And I think that's, a, that's either a church or a hat. I'm not sure which, but you can see the church there, right? So religious organizations are exempt from tax. Most not-for-profits are exempt from tax. Okay, they don't have to pay, pay tax, but we consider them not-for-profit because they are not associated with the government. They are private sector entities. So when we look at private sector entities, I think a lot of our time we get to always thinking about what for-profit private entities like Tesla is a for-profit uh, for private entity, okay? But also in the private sector are what? Are not-for-profit organizations like churches, like educational entities, private colleges. Can you think of a private college? Stanford? It's Good. Stanford is a private Harvard. college, right? Huh? Harvard. Harvard. Good. Where I teach in San Francisco, Golden Gate University, okay, is a private educational institution. Okay, good. And we have a variety and you can see some of the examples here. Okay, now we're not going to um, get to the not-for-profits till later, okay, but it's worthwhile just sort of setting the frame of what we're talking about when we talk about government and not-for-profit. Now, both government and not-for-profit entities do not have, it says, lack of profit motive, like they left something out, lacking, you know, sounds like a negative thing. They just don't have the focus of profit. Whether you realized it or not, most of what we were talking about in accounting in your uh, commercial accounting classes is what? Income determination and how that income does what? Increases the wealth of the shareholders and how we account for that capital maintenance. In government and not-for-profit, we are not nearly as interested in profit as we are how efficient are these entities in delivering what? Service. Okay, so in the case of the government, it's how tax dollars are being used to uh, to provide services and they're not trying to turn a profit on it. Okay, 
And in the case of the not-for-profit, it's how donors' donations, how donations are being used in order to achieve the objectives of the not-for-profit. So we're going to be getting away in many cases from this whole thing of having to capitalize our assets, having to depreciate assets, having to sit there and figure out um, you know, how to allocate depreciation in different periods so we can determine net income in any one period. We're more interested in understanding the presentation of financial information so we can show how efficient, how we effective we were in delivering services. So that's why you need a different class in governmental not-for-profit because the whole uh, focus of our accounting is different. Okay, now when we talk about the standard setting entities, okay, the two that we're going to focus on here is GASB and FASB, okay. FASB does what? Sets accounting standards both for-profit entities and what? and not-for-profit entities. Financial Accounting Standards Board is a seven-member board. They have seven members because they want to break a tie and a vote. To pass a new standard, all you need is a simple four to three majority. Okay, that's the FASB. And we're interested in this class because they set the accounting standards for what? what they call non-governmental not-for-profit organizations. Now you sit there and you say, well, I thought you told us that not-for-profit organizations are private sector entities. So why do I need the designation of a non-governmental not-for-profit? Well, they make that distinction because they would like to say that an organization like San Jose State is a government not-for-profit, meaning that it is what inside the government, but it operates sort of like a not-for-profit type entity, like a private college, right? They're both providing education and whatnot. So it's a private sector not-for-profit. They call that non-governmental not-for-profit that falls under the purview of the Financial Accounting Standards Board. We follow those standards. When we talk about state and local governments in this class, we're talking about the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. The GASB is a 15 member board, so a bigger board. Uh, I guess they figure, hey, we need more people sitting on our board because we've got to deal with the standards for the entire governments, all these different governments. And so I don't know why they have 15, but they have 15 members sitting on that board. And um, it's state and local government, and they also will issue the accounting standards for governmental not-for-profit, which is a fancy way of saying uh, organizations like San Jose State, who sort of have an analogous entity out there that's in the private sector, like a private college, and then a government-run college like San Jose State would be considered governmental not-for-profit. Okay. And then FASAB, as I mentioned, is the entity that sets the accounting standards for the federal government. And um, we're not going to probably say much more about federal government accounting than that right there, that the federal, um, it's the federal, I guess, uh, federal accounting standards advisory board, FASAB. Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board. It's a, um, I forget the number of people. They might have seven on their board. You know, maybe the GASB has seven too. I think I said 15, but I think 15 is the International Accounting Standards Board. Um, FASAB, I think has seven. They have three permanent members, the Treasury, Office of Management and Budget, and the GAO. And then they have a rotating four other members. So I think maybe all of these are seven. Um, anyway, you don't need to know the number of people that sit on these boards. You need to understand that what in this class, we're focusing on GASB for state and local governments. And we're talking about FASB when we talk about private sector not-for-profit organizations. Question? Okay. 
Okay, good. Now, when we look at our state and local government accounting, we are basically looking to see that money was spent for the intended purpose, was spent for the intended purpose. So what happens? Let's say we um, have, let's see if we can test my, uh, see how good my drawing abilities are. What's this? That road. Good. <laughs> we have a road. Very good. See how, what a genius drawer I am? Okay. And let's say the legislature decides that they're going to tax gasoline. Okay. And they're going to use that money for maintenance improvement of roads. Makes sense. Cars use gas. Some of them do. And we need to maintain the roads, cars, trucks, whatnot, drive on the roads. So let's put a tax on the gasoline and then use that money to, um, for road maintenance improvement. Okay. Well, what we would do was we would set up a fund and we're going to be looking at these fund structures in a minute, but this would be called a special revenue fund. Okay. We'd set up a fund, special revenue fund, and the fund's whole job would be to make sure that we spend money on what? On road improvements. So the special revenue is what? Is the gas tax coming in and then the spending it is on what? On road improvement and that fund would make sure that we spent the money for the intended purpose and it would make sure that we spent the amounts we had budgeted for that so if it was a million dollars that needed to be spent on road improvement this special fund job would be to make special revenue funds job would be to make sure that we spent a million dollars on road improvement okay so that means that we're not going to be nearly as interested in was this a profitable endeavor? In fact, in the California, state of California, that's almost impossible because we don't really have toll roads here. So if you go to Florida, they charge you to go so far down the freeway. It's ridiculous. It's not a freeway. It's a toll way. It's a toll road. Free means you don't have to pay. It doesn't mean that there's no traffic, right? They call it a freeway. I'm not free. I'm stuck, right? Okay, they call it a freeway because you don't have to pay, right? Toll roads, you have to pay to go so far. Even then, though, even if it's a toll road, they're not trying to turn a huge profit on it. State of California, the roads are not profitable. They're what? They are a drain on public resources, but we could help that process along by setting up a gas tax. That gas tax is considered a special revenue. We create a special revenue fund to sit there and account for that money being spent for road improvements. So we're really focusing on is the money spent for the, and they give you a lot of words here. I like to use the phrase intended purpose. Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we look at our government financial reports, we're going to see that we're going to have actual versus budget. Okay, so we're going to be studying and where I think sometimes students um, start to hate governmental accounting is we are going to require you to understand the budgetary journal entries associated with state and local government. Okay, and it takes a little while to get used to that. Okay, all entities have budgets, but only state and local government accounting has the budgetary requirements standardized. So we have to follow certain specific requirements. And if something is standardized and you have specific requirements, I can test you on it, the CPA exam can test you on it, et cetera. And that starts to get a little bit tough for some students at first. Eventually you get very good at this stuff. Okay. And then of course we have our actual. Okay. So we have budget entries, we'll have actual entries. We will generate two sets of financial statements or two, not sets, but two financial statements. One is going to be one that assesses the financial condition. Therefore, we're talking about what? 
a balance sheet. The other is going to determine the results of operations. We call that a, well, that's analogous. We don't call it that, but that's analogous to a, an income statement. So the primary statements we'll talk about, when we're talking about governmental is a balance sheet and an income statement. The balance sheet assesses financial condition. The income statement um, assesses the results of operations, okay? Now, again, the purpose of these financial statements are what? Did we spend money in compliance with laws? If the legislature says that a gas tax is to be used for road improvement, then our compliance would be, hey, did we spend it on road improvement? And were we in compliance with our budgetary constraints? We only spend a million dollars on road improvement. Okay, that will allow us then to evaluate the efficiency and effectiveness of this entity, this governmental entity, not in terms of a profit motive, but in terms of how effective, efficient they are in delivering services. Okay, for, um, uh, oh, I was gonna think we were gonna go over, let me do the not-for-profit slide first and then I'll come back to this. For not-for-profit, what? We want to make sure that um, we're reporting information so donors can understand how their donations were used to achieve the entity's objectives. So how did we make resource allocation decisions? How effective were we in providing the services or executing the mission of the not-for-profit? So if you give your money to an animal shelter, you would want to see, well, how effective was that entity in doing what in protecting animals and you know seeing if they find a home or whatever it is that uh, they're doing there okay now we're not going to say a whole lot about not-for-profit until we get into some of those later chapters um, most of our focus is going to be for a while here now on the state and local government accounting all right so they have this concept of interperiod equity. And what interperiod equity says is that you should balance your budget in any one period. You should balance your budget. In other words, your revenue should equal your expenditures in any one period. So you have interperiod equity. If you spend what? If you spend more than your resources, you spend more than you bring in then you're not practicing interperiod equity. So let me ask you a question. Do you think the federal government practices interperiod equity? Nope. No. Not at all. Not at all. Big time no, right? It's a big time no. You know, they always try to blame one party and the other on the deficit. It just depends and the debt. It just depends who's in. So if the Republicans are the ones that are adding to the debt and the deficit, they blame the Republicans, right? Then the Republicans get out and they blame the Democrats, okay? And if you look back, pretty much the government balanced its budget, pretty much. I mean, it didn't have a lot of deficit until about 1980, okay? The late 70s, early 80s is when this started. And under Reagan, they basically, Reagan went from a zero debt to about a trillion dollars in public debt. And then when George Bush, the father, got out, it was up to 3.5 trillion. When Clinton, the husband, got out, it was about up to 5 trillion. That's about the time that I was involved on the audit, first ever audit of the public debt. Um, we audited the financial reports on the debt. That was the first time it got audited. I was involved in that audit. I was running the auction issue cycle. And at that point in time, the federal government auctioned off about $2 trillion a year. It rolled over that $5 trillion, about, about almost, I think maybe it was more than half of it. Maybe it was more than $2 trillion. More than half of it got rolled over in any one year. And it's kind of crazy because if you think about it, what the federal government does is it finances a long-term debt on short-term financing. 
So most of the debt is made up of 30, 60, 90, maybe one year treasury bills. So there's a huge interest rate exposure there to the federal government, but the federal government realizes that uh, sometimes people wanna put their money into short term low risk securities. And so they're providing that vehicle uh, from a financing, from a finance aspect for, uh, you know, for those levels, those it's almost part of the banking system in that way. So it was about 3.5 under Bush, the father, 5 trillion under Clinton. So went up from 3.5 to 5 trillion under Clinton. Sometimes students say to me, but Clinton had a surplus the last two years of the eight years that he was in, there was a surplus, uh, but he added over the full eight years, you know, about one and a half trillion uh, to the debt. Then Clinton gets out and, um, you get uh, Bush the son, Bush the son, it goes from five to 10 trillion, Obama 10 to 20, Trump 20 to 30 trillion in debt and so on. They all take their turn, okay? And uh, so I don't know, it's, um, it's interesting that this, I don't know how this keeps going. The problem is, is at some point you start to get the debt that is becoming a larger and larger portion of the gross domestic product in any year. And the, the experience is that as you start to get that out of whack, then is when you start to see some real uh, economic bad being done by the debt. So, uh, so no, the federal government does not practice interperiod equity by any stretch. Okay. Okay, good. So let's just come over then. Okay, and that's about all we're going to say about not for profit. Back to state and local government accounting, because that's going to be our focus. Okay, now remember GASB, we said, is the standard setter in the uh, state for state and local governments. And what GASB says is if you are state and local government, you must provide this financial reporting package. Okay. So if I pick up the financial report of uh, San Jose, I will see this. If I pick up the financial report of the great city of Hayward, I will see this. If I pick up the financial report of the state of California, I will see this. So they're telling you this is the basic set of information that all state and local governments have to provide, okay? Now, they actually call out an order for this information. So they tell us the first thing, you can see I put a one in that box. The first thing you need to provide is a management discussion and analysis, an MDNA. That's the first thing you have to provide, okay? The second thing you have to provide are basic financial statements. That's the second thing. When I say the second thing you have to provide, you pick up that financial reporting package required by GASB. You look at it. First thing you see is what? MDNA. You read through the MDNA. The next thing you see are the basic financial statements. Now, when they report these basic financial statements, they report two levels. They report a consolidated government-wide level and a disaggregated fund level. So think of it this way right now. Let's say you had a uh, corporation that had several different segments. What would happen? The corporation would take all of those segments and do what? Consolidate them, do eliminating entries and whatnot and consolidate them into one set of consolidated financial statements. And then you might, if it was a public company, you might see some information about the segments, but you don't see every single piece that makes up that consolidation, right? In state and local government, they say, uh-uh, we're going to make you, cons you're going to have to report all of this disaggregated fund information, and you're going to have to show how that rolls up into the government wide. So not only do you see a consolidated and disaggregated funds, you also are providing information that sees how you can reconcile from that disaggregated fund information 
to the government wide information. Now, in this class, we're going to spend quite a bit of time here. We're going to spend some time here. And I am going to give you some exercises. I don't know that I will test you heavily on this, but I will give you some exercises that will show how you would go through the process of consolidating from the funds to the government wise. So don't jump out the window. This is not a government consolidation class. I'm not gonna grade you on that and make you do, but I am gonna give you some exposure in here as to how we would affect a consolidation from the fund level to reporting at the government wide level. And then the notes to the financial statements are always considered to be an integral part of those statements. So when we talk about the basic financial statements, we're talking about what? Government wide statements, fund financial statements, and the notes there too. That constitutes the basic financial statements. Any question on that so far? What does it mean by RSI? Good. RSI is required supplemental information, which you see spelled out down here. Okay. Oh, so what happens is the third piece is something called required supplemental information. For example, oh. let's say I have a pension plan and many state and local governments do. Gasby says, well, you need to provide some required supplemental information about the pension plan. And they tack that on after the financial statements. So it's not like they're repeating what's in the financial statements, they're supplementing the financial statements with additional information. And the reason I wrote RSI up at the top box, I think you see that now, is that what? The MDNA is also considered what? Supplemental, required supplemental information. Well, you say, well, why do you have it in a different box? Because Gasby told us that we have to show what? We have to show the MDNA first then we show the basic financial statements, then we show the rest of the required supplemental information that's not the MDNA. For example, different schedules, budgetary comparison schedules, these kinds of things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Ward, so is this a uh, vertical structure like the order that the financial statements are presented in? It's the order that the reporting package is presented in. The financial statements are only that middle part. Right, a component of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, correct, yeah. But it's, it's these are the components of the financial reporting model that all state and local governments have to have. And it starts with MDNA. That's the first thing you see. Then you see the basic financial statements and then you see the required supplemental information. Other than the MDNA, and again, it's split off from the other, you know, the MDNA is split off from the other required supplemental information because they want us to show it first. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can I, can I jump in with a question real, yeah, real quick? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you give me an example of who management is? Let's say for the state of California is like, is Gavin writing the MDNA? No. No. Um, the, the, it's the financial management. Okay. Of the government. So in the state of California, don't kill me if I'm not right on this, but I think it's the state controller's office. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. That, that would be the one that would write this MDNA. But your question is right on target to where I wanted to go because it's what? It's the financial management. So if you look at this thing, you look and there's really only two things on here you have what the basic financial statements and you have what required supplemental information so i'm sitting here in what you have you're required to provide all of this information some of it is the basic financial statements the other what is supplement well what it's what is it supplementing it's supplementing the only other thing that's up here which is the basic financial statements so when you read the mdna for say the state of California, it's not, in California, you know, the redwood trees grow higher than anywhere else in the world. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying last year we had a budget deficit of, and the budget deficit was caused by 
and we are investing in infrastructure. Therefore, we project that this uh, deficit will continue over this next five years while we're building this super collider, super califragic, you know, road, train, bus system, whatever the hell it is they're doing, they're going to call that out in the MDNA. And you might have some uh, charts, not charts, but tables that sit there. You might have a couple of charts, tables, and charts that sort of show where things are going. And then here come the what financial statements, so you can really start to dig in and start to see how um, things went with this entity's financial situation. You kind of wrote a narrative. Now you're seeing some financial reports. And then when you get down to this bottom thing, it's what this required set of new information other than MDMA, it schedules that tease out pieces and parts of the financial statements and give you even more detail than that. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead. And uh, again, as I said earlier, when we are looking at our government financial reporting, we're thinking about our uh, results of operations and our uh, financial position, our balance sheet and our income statement, okay? So when we're dealing with the government-wide statements, we will see something that is analogous to a balance sheet. We don't call it a balance sheet, but it's analogous to a balance sheet. And we will have something that is analogous to our uh, income statement, and that will show us the change in our net position. So let's first make sure maybe I'm jumping better cadence on here, would have been to say, what is net position? Well, net position is L-I-K-E. What's R-E? Like retain earnings, right? So we will report our net position on our balance sheet, which is like our retained earnings. And we will report our uh, change in net position. And change in net position is like what? Is like net income. But we don't call it net income. We call it the change in net position. I mean, if you got rid of dividends, I guess you could call what? Net income, the change in retained earnings, couldn't you? because your net income or loss is going to affect your retained earnings. It's not the only thing that affects retained earnings in a corporation because what? Corporations pay dividends, right? Governments don't pay dividends, okay? We don't sell the stock of a government somewhere and then pay dividends to the shareholders. There are no stocks that are sold, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's something that uh, they'll do in the future. They will finance the deficit because we're going to sell, you know, Rhode Island to some private shareholders or whatever, right? Okay, I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, so there is no stock in a government. So the only thing that changes our net position is what? Is our net income, but we don't call it net income. We call it change in net position. We don't call our equity equity, we call it what? Net position, but it's like retained earnings because our equity doesn't have stock and paid in capital in that. We only have what's left is the retained earnings, but we don't call it retained earnings, we call it net position. Question. Okay. Okay, good. Now, when we prepare our government-wide statements, we'll use a cruel basis of accounting economic resources um, financial focus, full accrual accounting, economic resources, financial focus, and we are practicing operational accountability. Now, what happens? What type of accounting have you been using ever since you discovered you're in love with accounting? That's a heart, it is. When you discovered you were in love with accounting, what kind of accounting were you practicing? Accrual? Is it for profit, for profit, yeah. Huh? For profit accrual, I guess. Well, 
for profit and accrual are not necessarily synonymous, but I guess I see when you fell in love with the county, right? It was accrual and it was for profit, but for profit and accrual are not synonymous. You can use accrual basis of accounting and not be necessarily being influenced by the profit motive. Okay. So what happens if you purchase an asset, what are you supposed to do? Pay cash. No. Are you kidding? The pushers. If you purchase an asset, you're not, you don't have to pay cash. If that was the case, when you rode through the Bay Area, you'd see nothing but empty fields. Everything that you see in the Bay Area, all those buildings and everything, were not paid for by cash. They were paid for by credit. Okay, so if you purchase a building on credit, you have a mortgage, what? You would debit asset, you would credit liability, right? For that mortgage, okay? This is accrual accounting. You don't sit there under accrual accounting and say, well, I don't record anything until I pay cash for it. If you have the, what? Control of that asset, you have future economic benefit, you have to record that asset and you have to record the associated. Now, if you paid cash, sure, credit cash, but if you typically don't for big, high, ca high cost assets, you usually get those on credit, right? You're gonna credit a liability. That's accrual accounting, isn't it? Guys? Yes, yes. Okay, so when we're at the government wide level, they're just telling us, use the same type of accounting you've been using ever since you fell in love with accounting, ever since you were two years old and decided you wanted to be an accountant. Accrual accounting, you're keeping track of your economic resources like assets, et cetera, and you're using an operational accountability focus, okay? Accrual basis, economic resources, operational accountability. Now you look at that and you say, well, why do I have to have fancy words here to tell me to do what I've been trained to do now for the last five, six years, 30, some people, 30 years that I've been looking at accounting. Why do I need somebody to tell me fancy words to do what I've been trained to do? Because when we get to the fund financial statements here, we're going to see that they don't always practice a cruel basis of accounting. So we need some way to distinguish between what we do at the government wide level versus what we're doing at that disaggregated level when we're looking at the fund statements. Remember those two sides with the arrows pointing back and forth. The fund statements we're going to see will not always use a cruel basis. So that's why we're making the point of calling out government wide, yes, use a cruel, not a big deal. Same accounting you've known for a long time. Where it starts to get interesting is as you move down to some of the funds, you start using something other than a cruel basis of accounting. We'll get to that here in a couple seconds. Question? Okay. All right, good. Now we come over and we have our fund financial statements and there are three categories and there are 11 funds. Okay, so now just to make sure we're all on the same page. Let me go back. That was that government wide, uses full accrual, uses economic resources, uses operational accountability, right? That's the consolidated. Here we have what? We have the disaggregated fund financial statements. And what I'm about to show you coming up on this slide that we were, that I just flipped back from, we're going to have three categories. We're going to have 11 funds. We have 11 funds and those funds fall into one of three categories, okay? So let's just take a look at that. By the way, guys, I know how horrible my writing is. Uh, it's better to listen to what I'm saying because I always call out what I'm saying what I'm writing, I call out what I'm saying. I call out what I'm writing and I repeat it. So I will, I think you're better off instead of trying to read my horrible writing, you're better off just hearing what I say if you wanna mark things up as you go along. Uh, three categories, 11 funds. And so in some cases, the slides are already marked up and you probably can see the markings on your slides that you pulled down from uh, Canvas but it's not like I'm not gonna to continue to write on these slides. 
And then sometimes you say, well, put up what you wrote on. I'm not going to do that. Okay. So try to follow along. If you think I write a, hel a helpful note on one of the slides, write it down because I can't always be trying to hurry up and post back up now if I wrote something else on one of the slides. They are marked up to a certain extent, but I'm not going to get into the business of trying to always constantly, every time I decide to you know, draw a heart on one of the slides, I got to now post up a new set of slides. Okay. All right. So three categories, 11 funds. And so you come over three categories. We have our governmental funds. There are five fund types in there. Okay. We have, we'll cover that in chapters three through six. So our first couple of midterms really are going to kind of be focusing there. We have our proprietary funds. There are two of those. That's chapter seven. And then we have our fiduciary funds. Okay. So three categories, governmental funds, proprietary, fiduciary, and we have what? We have five types of governmental funds, two types of proprietary funds, four types of fiduciary funds. That's what? Four plus two is six plus five is 11 funds covered in these various chapters. Okay. They're calling out the funds here. Um, we're going to, I'm going to give you something else that will help you to see what the names of the funds are here in a little while. So don't worry about that. Names of the funds right now, just know three categories, 11 funds, five governmental, two proprietary, and four fiduciary. So what are we going to do? The funds then, as you can see, are all of this detailed information. We're going to take that detailed information and do what? Consolidate it and report it what? reported at the government wide level, right? With me so far? Questions? No? Okay. Okay, good. So uh, I wanted to wait to um, call out the names of the funds because what I have on this slide is a good way to remember what category the funds fall into and the names of the funds, okay? So what happens? We have our governmental funds, and in our governmental funds, we have the general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, and you can pronounce this mnemonic here as GRASP, as GRASP. You're saying, but there's no A. I know, but it's a mnemonic, so just spell it, say it in a way that'll help you remember what the funds are in the governmental fund category, general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, and the permanent fund, okay? Now, proprietary funds, there are two of them. There's the internal service fund and the enterprise fund, okay? So we have what? We have a internal service fund, an enterprise fund, making up the proprietary fund. You can add to this mnemonic if you want to by saying S-E-C. You say, but John, C has two E's. I know, but if you pronounce this C, you can have grass C, and then this thing finishes off, and that, and the way I like to pronounce this, I just pronounce this KIP, in that for our fiduciary fund category, our third category has four funds, you have the custodial fund, investment trust fund, private purpose trust fund, and then just remember the pension fund. And you don't need to remember other employee benefits, whatever. It's just easy enough, just remember KIP. Okay, so GRASP, C, KIP. These are our funds, okay? And what we do is we sit here and we take these funds and we consolidate them into my government-wide statements. Okay, now when I look at my government-wide statements, and we're gonna take a look at these here in a couple of minutes, what time do we get out of here, 4.30? Okay, when we look at our um, governmental, uh, our, our government-wide statements, we're going to see two columns. We're going to see government funds and we're going to see governmental activities, excuse me, and we're going to see business type activities. Now what happens? 
we only consolidate our grass funds plus our internal service fund under governmental activities. And that gets a little bit confusing because you're sitting there and saying, well, why wouldn't it just be the governmental funds and the government activities? It turns out, and we'll study this more, that the internal service fund, think of that phrase, internal service fund only provides services internally to the government. For example, do governments own vehicles? Yeah. Let's hope one's not behind you when you're coming home too late, right? Sometime, right? Police cars <laughs> are government vehicles, fire trucks are government vehicles. So these are emergency type vehicles, right? Well, the government doesn't want to be taking a police car to Al's garage, okay? They're going to say what? We're going to create an internal motor pool. And that internal motor pool is going to make sure that these emergency type vehicles are operating at high specifications, right? So that motor pool would be an example of an internal service fund. Now, can I go and drive my car up to the internal service fund and say, hey, can you change oil for me today? No, they're going to say, excuse me, who are you? We only service what? Government-owned vehicles, et cetera. So the customers of an internal service fund, like a motor pool, are the other governmental funds. So we call them a proprietary fund at the um, fund level because they're sort of like a business, proprietary business. They're sort of like a business in that what? They're gonna build the other funds for their work and get reimbursed for their cost. So they're kind of like a business, but not really because they don't serve the public. They serve the other governmental funds. So when we get to the government wide level, GASB has told us that gets consolidated under governmental activities. The enterprise fund example would be say a water utility. Now do, does only the government use water? No, we all use water, but you do what? You pay a government entity for the use of that water. We haven't gotten to the point yet where they privatize the delivery of water. Oh, please God, right? We don't want you know some corporation sitting up there saying, well, are you thirsty? Because <laughs> we're gonna charge you some high price for water. We've all decided that what? Water is something that we all need to live. And therefore, we're going to sit here and we're going to have the government run that. And we're going to charge not only the government's use of water, which they do use some, but most of the water that is paid for is paid for by what? Those outside the government. So even though it's proprietary in nature that you're charging for a service, the people you're charging are not the other funds, but what? those outside of the government. So we decided, GASB decided that that should be under something called business type activity, okay? So when we consolidate, you take your what? Your general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, all of your governmental funds, plus the internal service fund. And we roll that all under governmental activities. When you're dealing with your business type activity column at the government wide love, level that your enterprise fund, okay? Now you get to the fiduciary fund. If I'm taking care of something in a fiduciary basis, do I own that? Yes. No. I do? Um, I don't I own it. I'm a caretaker. I'm taking care of it for somebody else, right? So what happens is the government takes care of assets that belong to somebody else sometimes. And the best example here is what? The pension fund. The pension assets don't belong to the government. They belong to what? They belong to the employees that will eventually retire from the government, right? So when we're dealing with our fund level, where we're wanting to see that money's being spent properly, what happens? We sit here and Gasby says, yeah, report the fiduciary funds at the fund level. But by the time you get up to what? 
up to the government wide level and we're seeing how when you operate we're not going to include assets and whatnot that what that you don't use in your operations so when you get to the government wide uh, government wide level you do not report the fiduciary funds okay two levels of reporting fund level government wide level right Fund level shows all the detail, the disaggregated information. Consolidated shows what? The consolidation of that fund level. What do we consolidate? We consolidate our governmental funds, general funds, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, plus uh, private uh, permanent fund, plus what? One of my proprietary funds, my internal service fund, that all goes under governmental activities and what? our enterprise fund goes under the business type activity. Question. Um, yes, I do have a question. Uh, why do we include um, the service and internal um, into the government activities, but it's not a business activities? Thank you. Um, because the people that use the internal service fund are the other governmental funds. That motor pool example I gave you. You can't get your car fixed at the internal serve at the motor pool, right? Right. So they're saying really that's all governmental activity, but we don't want to treat it as a governmental fund because it operates more as a business because the other funds sit there and they charge the funds for the service and then provide the service. So it's more like a uh, exchange that goes on between the two entities, the other funds and the internal service fund. So you decide to put it under proprietary activity but when you get to the consolidated put under governmental activities because really it's only providing services inside of the government, right? Right. For the enterprise fund, the services that are being provided there, like a water and sewer, those are what? Those are being provided mostly to the outside, aren't they? The citizens right. use water and businesses use water and stuff. And so we're going to call that a business type activity because it's okay. most of the activity that's going on is with outside, outside of the government versus, versus inside the government. Okay, okay, got it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, good. Now, what I'm going to show you here is the government wide um, statement of net position. This is the balance sheet. Remember, we said that we have two government-wide statements, a balance sheet, and an income statement. So this one is like the balance sheet. We don't call it balance sheet. We call it statement of net position, okay? And when you look at this thing, you have what? There's that governmental funds activity. And I apologize for my horrible writing here, guys, but it's what? General fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, plus what? plus the internal service fund will all get rolled up and go into governmental activities. What gets reported in the business type activities? The enterprise funds. And an entity may have more than one um, enterprise fund. They could have several, right? So all of the enterprise funds would get rolled up and be reported at a consolidated level under the business type activity, okay? Now, just to understand the consolidation nature of this, let's go ahead and let's play around with this thing a little bit. So you have your assets, your liabilities, you come down, you have your net position, which is like your retained earnings. And so your total net position here is 1,835,000. Just looking at that, what, that bottom line sort of retained earnings piece the total net position is 1,835,000. Now, on the next slide, what I've done is I've given you the proprietary fund financial statement. So now we're done at the, down at the fund level 
and we're looking at the two proprietary funds, the internal service fund and the enterprise fund. But when you look, they give me two enterprise funds here. They give me water and sewer and parking. Okay, so these are two enterprise funds that constitute the enterprise funds of this progressive township, whatever. Well, I put a plus sign between those because what happens? When you add those together, okay, and you come down to net position, the total net position of those two funds together is 1,835,000. Does that number sound familiar? That was what? The total net position that we saw up here under business type activities, which was a consolidation of the two enterprise funds, in that case, the parking and the water and sewer funds. When we added those together, we got this consolidated net position of 1,835,000. I could do something similar by taking my governmental funds and my internal service fund and showing you how those roll up to the total net position or governmental activities, but I'm not gonna show you that now because your head will explode. The takeaway at this point is that what? We sit here and we have the fund statements, governmental funds, proprietary funds, fiduciary funds, governmental funds, there's five of them, general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, my proprietary funds, there's two of them, the internal service fund, the enterprise fund, and then for my fiduciary category, there's four of them, which is going to be my private purpose trust fund, my custodial fund, my um, investment trust fund, and my pension fund. Okay, I remembered all of them, okay? So we do what? We take those funds and we roll them up at the government-wide level, my governmental plus my one proprietary fund, my internal service fund for my business type activity. It's just my enterprise funds and I don't consolidate at the government wide level my fiduciary funds. That's all I want you to understand right now. Question? What are the major software uh, providers for, to, to do this kind of stuff for governments? Is it the same as like any company would have, you would just tailor it for governmental accounting. You mean to, to um, that are going to spit out these financial statements? Yeah, uh, that, are gonna, that are gonna spit out these financial statements at the end of the period. Yeah, I don't know offhand the major ones that they use or if there's a primary vendor. I mean, that might be something worth looking up, but they absolutely do use software <laughs> to do this. Yeah. And what they do is, um, they actually record everything at the fund level. So and we're getting a little beyond, but, um, you know, the way the book, it's irritating because the book says a dual track system as though we're recording things at the government wide level and the fund level simultaneously. And sometimes I'll explain things to you that way. But if you try to do that in practice, you would have a disaster you would never be able to get the government-wide statements to talk to the fund financial statements, right? That's not how you perform accounting in an entity where you've got multiple layers that are going to be consolidated. So what they do is they report everything at the uh, fund level. All transactions are recorded, I should say, at the fund level, debit credit at the fund level. And then, yes, they use a software. And I'm sure there's probably a vendor that dominates in here. I don't know who it is but they use a software to then consolidate from those fund statements to those government-wide statements. We're yep. gonna practice doing it the old fashioned way <laughs> with a spreadsheet that's gonna have a column in which you convert the fund information to the government-wide, just so we kind of understand what the software is doing. But yeah, there's software that does it. Question? Uh, are, are we doing that spreadsheet today, Professor? We're done. Oh, okay. oh, never mind. That spreadsheet will be much, much later. If you look down, there's a call out for the consolidation process. I can't run you through the consolidation now because you're not ready. There's certain things that have to happen. 
and there's there's things you have to know in order to be able to do that and we're, we don't know that yet okay thank you professor mm -hmm. oh and uh, i guess it's uh, administrative questions so yeah as for the homework right uh, are we gonna be late for any homework because we don't have the uh because we don't have the connect today no because i'm not looking at your homework Oh, so yeah. that, you're missing an opportunity to maybe look at some homework questions to help you understand what we talked about. But at this point, my advice would be just hang in there till Thursday. I know, you know, you guys are kind of like in this like they got you like they got you like some kind of I don't know what the word like you're in the Marines or something, right? It's like they're dragging you around, go here, do this. Well, this class is going to be a little different. I'm not going to treat you like that. I want you to come away with an understanding of some things. And I'm not so much interested in seeing how many hoops I can make you jump through between now and the next class. So hang tight. Uh, I'll figure out that problem with um, Connect or whatever, with McGraw-Hill, whatever's going on there. I'll have an answer for you no later than when we start class on Thursday. OK, thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. And you are having office hours tomorrow? Yeah. All right. I have CPA oh. exam questions. Okay. I'll be sitting here. Cool. If you come in and it's put you in the waiting room, um, don't, you know, just, you know, find something else to do while you're waiting to come in. It's not like I have 52 people coming to my office hour, but you know, there's a chance somebody will be there. And I do it one at a time because sometimes students want to talk about grades or their transcript or something. And you know, I can't have the whole world in there looking at that point. So I do it by, there's a waiting room. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Good work, guys. Good to have met you all. Uh, we'll get through chapter one next time, obviously, and we'll make some good headway into chapter two. Don't worry if we're not, I'm not interested in touching every single base on the syllabus as it's laid out. We'll get to everything we need to, okay? Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. Bye, right, Professor. Have a good rest of the day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, Professor. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Professor, could I ask a question? Yeah. Quick. Um, if like I was.